Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I have very, very, very special guest. Joining with me now, Michael Sama. So Michael Sama is one of my hero, one of my intellectual hero, hero along with Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, uh, etc. So Dr. Michael Sama is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, the host of the podcast, The Michael Sama Show. He has authored several books, such as Why People Believe Weird Things, The Science of Good and Evil, Happen on Earth, and many more. So, Dr. Sharma, thanks for being here. Nice to see you. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, welcome from the other side of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? I, I live in Indonesia. Have you ever been, yeah. have you ever been here in Indonesia? Um, not directly let's see no i don't think so where have i been well i've been to borneo does that count yeah that is kalimantan <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so okay yes i've been <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i live in, in 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 indonesia and a lot of people here are so religious they're so conservative we are not only religious we are also superstitious well of course and we believe in you know, law of attraction, new edge, new edge stuff like that. Uh, that is, if you want something, then just ask the universe. So the universe will give it to you. That is the law of attraction. So a lot of us believe that's, that that kind of things. So I think I want to talk about that. So my first question is, uh, can you explain to me in layman's term, why do you think that so many people, even smart, intelligent people can believe this kind of things well uh, uh first of all the short answer that i give in my first book why people believe weird things in the second edition when i added a chapter called why smart people believe weird things the short answer is that because they're better at rationalizing beliefs that they hold for non-smart reasons yeah. that is to say most of us hold beliefs for um for, for reasons that have nothing to do really with reason and evidence and 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 logic and so forth, um, we hold them for personal emotional reasons or tribal reasons, our religious beliefs, our political beliefs, our ideologies are mostly um, related to our upbringing, what culture we were born and raised in, the influence of our peers, our teachers or mentors, pop culture, the, the, the culture at large where you you live and so on. Now, these are, I mean, on average, of course, there are exceptions. But, you know, most people born in the West are, are likely to be Jewish or Christian and in third place is Muslim. But if you're born in Indonesia, you're you're less like far less likely to be Jewish or Christian and far more likely to be Muslim. And so that tells us something about religious beliefs that are different from scientific beliefs. I mean, there's no such thing as Indonesian physics, right? There's just physics <laughs> and biology and, and, and physiology and medicine and so on. Uh, the fact that there are such w diverse religious beliefs, depending on where you happen to have been born, tells us something deeply about those kind of beliefs. They're not empirically true, literally true. They're not the kind of truths we think about in science. They are something else. They're representing some other kind of belief, some other kind of truth, a religious truth, a political truth, something like that. That's how I think about that. So once you've gone down the path of believing some particular thing, whatever it is, then the mind goes to work to find reasons to believe it. Like here are the six reasons I'm a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian or a Democrat or Republican or whatever. People are quite good at doing this. Uh, and they do that to win arguments, to, you know, explain publicly why they hold the beliefs that they do. Yeah. But that's not why they hold them in the first place. They didn't come to the table, you know, with a blank slate uh, of a mind and go, well, let's see, I'll just try all the different religions and see which is the right one. As if you were an anthropologist from Mars coming to Earth going, let's see, which is the right religion? That would be a silly question. There is no right religion, and uh, and that's how I think about those things. So that's why. What 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 do you think about people like uh, Francis Collins, an ex atheist, a scientist who who believe in Jesus Christ? 
Yeah, so Francis is an interesting case. I wrote about him in my book, The Believing Brain. I know him and have met him several times and talked to him and interviewed him about that for my book. And basically, he says he became a Christian for more religious or emotional or personal reasons. And then after the fact, do, did exactly what I said most people do. He he then looked around the world and found lots of different specific arguments in favor of Christianity in this case for him as the, the one true religion. I'm not sure he says that uh, to the exclusion of other religions, but for him, that's his religion. And th these are the reasons he believes. He wrote a book about this uh, called The Language of God. Yeah. That's mostly a defense of evolutionary theory because a lot of Christians don't accept evolution because they think they're not supposed to. But he shows, in fact, it's totally compatible. You should be a you should be an evolutionary theorist, or you should accept evolutionary theory and be a Christian because it's true, and that you know we we should believe things that are true. And you know this was in, in his mind, this is evolution was God's way of creating the diversity of life. And uh, so, because he's smart and educated, he's really good at uh, constructing arguments that sound really rational, scientific, science based. You know, and here's good reasons. But the way I think about it is that these are reasons to believe if you already believe. If you don't, they're not going to convince somebody to believe. Yeah, I want. I want to ask you how to debunk it. I mean, there are so many people in Indonesia. Uh, there are so many people here talking about. Uh, law of attraction they use scientific language they use scientific jargon like energy quantum or particles and so many people <laughs> believe this because because they think that it is scientifically proven this is science they said so well i believe it is not science it is well i believe it is pseudoscience so how to detect how to debunk it yeah well so first of all i i should say that uh, the culture you described in Indonesia is the history of the world. That's how most people everywhere believed. It's rare that, you know, we in the West are mostly skeptical of those things. Almost nobody believes in witches anymore, for example, or that, you know, the reason there are hurricanes and droughts and, and pandemics and accidents is because of demons and, and witches and these kinds of things. Nobody believes that. In, well, in the West it, it, anymore. Well, people in Indonesia still believe that. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. That's what I'm saying. People in the West used to believe that. Oh, I mean, yeah. What I just described is the you know the Middle Ages and the early modern period, until the scientific revolution and the age of reason, and the Enlightenment that it expelled all those uh, crazy ideas. I mean, women cannot actually fly on brooms. They can't. <laughs> so at some point, that belief is gonna is gonna you know collide with reality. And it hasn't yet, I guess, in Indonesia, but it will in time. With secularization, industrialization, democracy, education, um, technology, and so forth, you know, the, the secularization will come slowly in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you know, those, the, your fellow citizens go through something like an enlightenment, a scientific revolution. Um, anyway, that's how, how I think about that. I, you know, I, I again, you don't want to, um, be too critical of your fellow citizens because that's the way most people be believed in history. And so what I'm arguing is that it's not a, a bug in the, in the program. It's a feature as computer people say it's built into our psychology and cognition to find meaningful patterns, to connect a to B, to think there's some connection between thinking positive thoughts and the universe giving me what I want. Of course, it's just a confirmation bias. You're just remembering all the times you had positive thoughts and something good happened. You're forgetting all the times you had positive thoughts and nothing happened or something bad happened, yeah. right? And, um, you know, so it's really quite unscientific to say that there's a, you know, a, a law of attraction. Because what does that imply? That people that are poor uh, just have po negative thoughts? I mean, what about poor children? You know, a one-year-old who's starving in Africa. You're telling me that, you know, they just didn't ask the universe for food, you know, and, and if there is a God, why doesn't God deliver the food to these people that are too young to ask the universe for food? You know, that kind of thing. You know, it's the counterfactuals. Um, you know, people fall on hard times. Just bad things happen. It's just yeah. the way the universe is structured, you know, entropy. Things run down. 
It's just, it just shit happens the way it goes. Mm -hmm. And to think that it all happens for a reason mm -hmm. or that there's some entity or agent or force that directs things to happen for a reason, um, that's superstitious thinking. So you did skepticism, right? So how to educate people in Indonesia? <laughs> yeah, how to educate lay people? I mean, it is hard to teach people about skepticism. Uh, so it is really hard for me to to tell my friend even to look for evidence, not to believe in a, a ghost or something. I mean, like, well, you can imagine if uh, a person like Deepak Chopra come to Indonesia and he talk about a lot of things about uh, quantum, about consciousness, they will believe it. They will easily believe it. So how to educate? Do you any? Do you have any tips or tricks about how to tell people? Well, it starts with um, learning how to communicate with people respectfully, clearly. Um, I wouldn't start off with saying, you know, there's no ghosts. There's no such thing as ghosts. Um, because people say, well, what do you mean? I, I saw a ghost the other night. Yeah. You know, well, you weren't there. How do you know what they saw? Right. So you can start by just asking questions like, how do you know that's true? Whatever it is somebody says. How do you know there's ghosts? What would it take to change your mind? What would it take to falsify your idea? Is there some way we can test this? You know, you say there's ghosts. I've never experienced ghosts. I don't know if there's ghosts or not. I suspect there's not, but... You know, I could change my mind. What? Show me the evidence. You know, just asking probing questions like that. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just to get people to think about the source of their information. Like, where did you hear that? Or who told you that? Or what makes you think that's true? And then you kind of get the wheels turning like, huh, yeah, huh, where did I hear that? No, I heard, uh, you know, a friend of a friend told me this. Well, maybe the friend's not reliable. Maybe they they misperceive things. You know, we all make mistakes. You know, something like that is a way to at least start thinking about those sorts of things and also find things that they're skeptical about. Um, like, you know, do you believe in the Greek god Zeus? You know, most people today will go, well, no, that's ridiculous. It's like, well, why is that ridiculous? People used to believe in Zeus. M maybe there is a Zeus. How do you know there isn't? <laughs> and they don't know, right? Okay. And, you know, so then you can use the line, you know, some of us just go one god further. Right, you, you don't believe in you're a Zeus atheist. I'm a Zeus atheist, and Wotan and Isis and I Osiris and Ganesha, the blue elephant god, you know, and so on. Most people are skeptical of all those gods. Just some of us just go one god further. Well, let's talk about Zeus gods or uh, this deities. I know you are an atheist. You are my hero, right? So. What is your what is your definition of atheism? I mean, new atheism like Dawkins or Sam Harris or you, you define atheism as a lack of lack of belief, right? And the other philosopher define atheism as uh, a belief that there is no God. So, yeah. So I'm gonna ask you, what is your definition of atheism, and why do you think that? definition is true yeah okay so there's a couple of ways to think about this there's different kinds of atheism strong atheism the yeah. statement uh, you know there is no god uh, that would be strong atheism i believe there is no god which is different than weak atheism which is i just lack a belief in a god i mean there might be but i i don't see the evidence for it so i'm withholding belief uh, and so i'm an atheist in that sense those are both you know oft commonly used um De definitions of the word. Um, I would be a weak atheist in that sense. I can't prove there is no God. I'd be quite surprised if there was, but um, and, but I'm happy to change my mind. So I don't know that there is no God. Uh, and that, that, but that's just talking epistemologically, what we know and how we know it. Um, you know, ontologically speaking, I don't think it's possible to know for sure one way or the other. So that would be agnostic in the way that Thomas Henry Huxley meant when he coined that term. In 1869, agnostic is somebody who uh, it's, it's not just that you don't know for now and are withholding judgment, but that it's unknowable. That's what he meant by agnostic, not knowable. Uh, there's not it's, it's not like you're waiting for one more experiment or one more good argument, and then you'll make your decision. Like, is global warming real or not? 
I don't know. Show me the evidence and I'll make up my mind. I don't think the God question is in that category. I'd say it's, it's a, it's a known unknowable. I mean, we all know what God is supposed to be. I don't think it's knowable in any um, empirical sense. Because if you, if you manage to produce or show me evidence of a, a super advanced being that was capable of, let's say, genetically engineering new forms of life, that would just be a super advanced human or alien intelligence. Yeah. I mean, so what kind of evidence that will make you believe that there is a God? I don't think there is. I don't think it's possible. I mean, look, we're, you know, we're about to produce a, a artificial general intelligence. It may not happen in the next couple of years. It may take decades or maybe even centuries. It's a hard problem, but it's coming, you know, so a super advanced artificial intelligence that's capable of thinking pretty much anything, solving any problem. That would be, relatively speaking, omniscient compared to us, rather limited intelligent beings. So why wouldn't that be God? I mean, God is, it depends on how you define it, but God is often defined as an omniscient, omnipotent being, right? So if you create an artificial intelligence, a far, far future, super advanced human uh, or artificial intelligence, or we encounter extraterrestrial intelligences that are, you know, millions of years more advanced than us on an evolutionary and, and technological time scale, they're going to appear to be omniscient and omnipotent. So why wouldn't they be God? And when uh, I present this hypothesis to believers, they go, no, 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 I'm not talking about aliens. I mean, God is this special supernatural being outside of space and time and so on and so on. Well, how do you know they're outside of space and time? you're in space and time. So you, you can, by definition, you can only detect things that are in this world, in this space time. Mm -hmm. So how do you know that? If, and, and if they're interacting with our world, somehow they're reaching into the world to stir the particles, to do something from outside the world. How does that happen? Yeah. Where is this place outside of the universe? Uh, let's imagine that we have, uh, that we have uh, a time machine. And let's say that we go back to 2000 years ago to see Jesus uh, crucified. And then three years later, we, we look at him that he, uh, that he rose from the dead. Would that be a good evidence? Oh, interesting. Yes, uh, that would. Yeah. Okay, sure. I, I will. I'll take that trip with you. <laughs> let's go back and <laughs> let's go back and see what actually happened. Right. <laughs> so, so then you, you would believe that. Uh, Jesus arise from the dead. That, and... that would do it, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, the problem is, what if it's the equivalent of a first century Penn and Teller who are doing magic tricks? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen Penn and Teller uh, walk on water and uh, turn water into wine. I I've seen magicians make the dead come back to life. Uh, there's there's an old trick where you, you take a, a, a little fly you capture a fly and you put them in the refrigerator and, and they, be, they become so cold. They don't even move. It looks like they're dead. So you show somebody, you hold their hand and you show somebody a dead fly and you, you just sort of close your hand and just go like, woo -ah, woo -ah, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and while you're doing that, you're heating them up and you open it up and it flies off. And, the, and people are like, Oh my God, he brought the dead back to life. The fly was never dead. Okay. So, you know, there's tricks like that. And so even with your thought experiment, I'm not sure that I wouldn't be watching a magician just pulling my leg because I know a lot of professional magicians personally. And, you know, they do stuff because they don't tell me because I'm not a magician. They don't tell me how it's done that I'm just baffled. I mean, it looks like genuine magic, but it's not magic, magic, supernatural magic. It's trick magic, conjuring magic. Is it because you are already committed to naturalism? Yes, I suppose. But as opposed to what? Supernaturalism? Supernaturalism or theism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, deism, yeah, that's slightly slightly different. Because in deism, at least technically, uh, is that there was a, a god, a deity, who started the whole thing off and then stepped aside, and then the whole thing just runs. Well, how, how is that any different from what we observe? I mean, it's possible, but there's no way to falsify that. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't really go take much uh, interest in deism that way. It's not testable. Um, y you know, just, yeah. I, yeah. To me, to, for, for an idea to be embraced, there has to be some way to test it uh, and get at it. Otherwise, 
it's interesting, you know, it could be, uh -huh. uh, but you know, I don't know where to go from there. What What do you think about a uh, fine tuning argument? I mean, Dawkins even said that this 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 is the best argument for God. The fine tuning. Yeah, argument. I've 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 uh, I've made that statement too. Uh, you know, I I cover in my books. I cover all the different arguments for God's existence and the the fine tuning argument. It's probably the most interesting one, but there are perfectly rational uh, counters to that. You know that what other kind of universe could we be in? This is the weak anthropic principle. We have to be in a universe that's fine tuned for life, or else there'd be no life. Asking why is there life, right? Mm -hmm. So, but but the strong anthropic principle that is, it looks like it was fine tuned from the beginning, like there's a fine tuner, and therefore some kind of intelligent designer, or God, deity super advanced aliens, something. Um, and uh, But even there, you know, there's so much we still don't know about the origins of the universe and why we have those numbers that we have. And because we don't have a grand unified theory of physics unifying the small quantum world with the large general relativity uh, cosmology, then we don't really know what to think about those fine-tuned equations. You know, uh, Steven Weinberg li liked to say, once those forces, uh, those two kind of branches of physics are unified through some grand unified theory, then then we may have, there may not be like six odd numbers, six fine num fine tuned numbers. There may just be one, mm -hmm. you know, that, that may be explained by just better physics. So I'm inclined to say it's an interesting problem. We, we have several explanations for it. The God answer is one of them, but there's could be multiple universes, multiple you know kinds of physics in different universes, and you know so on and so forth. There's a you know half a dozen different interesting alternatives to the God hypothesis, and I I I, I, I am inclined to just say let's wait and see. I don't really know. Nobody mm -hmm. knows. What is your best argument for atheism besides lack of evidence? Well, that's it. I mean, there, there's no other argument beyond that. Not, and there's nothing special about atheism. I mean, I, I don't, I don't believe in astrology either. Mm -hmm. I don't even need a word. A a, a astrologer, <laughs> uh, or you know, a bigfootist. You know, there could be a bigfoot, but uh, but uh, and if you show it to me, I'll believe it. But at the moment, I withhold belief because the evidence is weak. Uh, it's same principle. Do you think that? As an atheist, have have the burden of proof to to justify our atheism. No, no <laughs> because because atheism is not a position. It's not a positive assertion about a particular belief. It's just saying I don't believe in God. That's it. Full stop. Nothing more to derive from that. You could be a liberal. You could be a conservative politically. You know, you could have all sorts of other beliefs that have nothing to do with atheism. So you have to ask me about that. You know, you have to say, well, what what do you, what do you believe in? Well, I believe in civil rights and women's rights. I believe in same-sex marriage. I believe in equal treatment under the law. I believe in free speech. I believe in separation of church and state, and so on and so on. There's all sorts of things that I believe in: rationality, reason, science, empiricism, logic. These are things I have positive assertions about my beliefs. That I hold um, that have nothing to do with atheism, one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the one of the problem for being an atheist is that we cannot justify, we cannot, we can have sound foundation for objective morality. And I mean, I know the argument is not uh, whether an atheist could be good or bad, but the argument is that an atheist cannot have sound foundation for objective morality like if i say that hitler was bad was evil i cannot objectively say that hitler was objectively evil so how do you think about this what do you think about this sure how you can of course you can say hitler was objectively evil he because he was how do you know ask the yeah. jews he exterminated how they feel about it well the ones that survived anyway you know they'll tell you why he was evil because they don't want that to happen to any because you don't want to have happened to you what happened to the jews therefore hitler was evil so in other words ask somebody else ask the affected parties you know there's you, you don't need an outside source outside of the universe or outside of the world uh, to tell you what's right or wrong 
Um, and in any case, different gods have written different uh, books of morality, and they often contradict. So who's the right one? There's that problem. But um, just start with something like the golden rule, which which I uh, articulate as the principle of interchangeable perspectives. This comes from Steven Pinker's uh, book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. That is to say, how would you feel if somebody did this to you? Okay, it's what Abraham Lincoln said, as I would not be a slave, I would not be a slave owner. In other words, I don't want this done to me, right? It's it's the John Rawls's theory of justice, um, this kind of original position in which you and I are part of a society. I don't know which group I'm going to be in, and neither do you. So we should structure the laws such that no group gets any special privileges, uh, male or female, you know, white or black, Protestant or Catholic. It, it doesn't matter. Whatever the group is, um, nobody gets special privileges, right, uh, under the law. Everybody's treated equally. And, and you just start with that. You just start right there. You know, um, how would you feel if somebody did that to you? That's objective. Um, and, and from there, you can build a whole moral system, which I do. Um, in my book, The Moral Arc, that um, from there you can go out into society and just say, well, what kind of political system works best? And while you can fine-tune the different versions of democracy, say, everybody knows that democracies are better than autocracies. You have only to ask, where would you rather live, North Korea or South Korea? South Korea. Everybody, everybody says South Korea, of course. What are you, insane? Well, how do you know that? Did God tell you that? No, you don't no. need God to de derive that. Just look at what people do, you know, or just take before the unification of Germany, would you rather live in East Berlin or West Berlin? Well, we know where people preferred to live. They had to build a wall to keep uh, East Berliners living in East Berlin. They didn't want to live there because it was a crappy society, a horrible government, you know, impoverished economy. So it doesn't, it doesn't work. So people will just tell you what is objectively true with their own decisions. They vote with their feet. So what if a masochist come to you and say, hey, I like, I love suffering. Would you like to torture me? Well, okay, but the exception tests the rule in a sense. You know, there's a reason we have, you know, a word for that, sadist, uh, is somebody who likes to, you know, experience pain. Okay, but the average person is not interested in that. Uh, you know, the average person, you know, how many, would you rather be hungry or satiated? Would you rather be thirsty or have your thirst quenched? Would you rather be healthy or, or, or disease ridden? You know, would you rather be free or enslaved? You know, and just go right down the line. Yeah. Uh, and the vast, but you might sign, find some weirdo that goes, yeah, I want to be a slave. Okay. On average, most people <laughs> for the most part do not want to be slaves and they never did. And the people that enslaved them, on some level, knew this was true. That's why they used chains and whips and instruments of torture, uh, because they knew that these people are they're going to run away if we don't lock them up, uh, if we don't have some kind of instruments and tools in society to hold them in bondage. They're going to leave. They're going to run away. Why? Because who the hell wants to be enslaved? Nobody. So the reason why I brought this up is because I watch uh, William Lane Craig. So do you have any plan to debate him? I've debated uh, William Lane Craig in Mexico oh. and, and uh, Puebla, Mexico in a, a, a conference called City of Ideas. Um, and he and I, it was a weird, uh, there were several of us on each team and we were in a boxing ring. <laughs> <laughs> It was like a boxing match. I think they even played Rocky. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of is it, funny. Is it on YouTube? But, yes, it's on YouTube. Yes, you can oh. you can watch it. I think it was me and Dawkins and Matt Ridley against oh, William yeah, Ray yeah. Craig. Um, and uh, Michio Kaku was there too, right? Michio. Uh, no, that was a different one. Michio was at a different. Really? Uh, there was three or four of these uh, the City of Ideas conferences I, I've been to. Maybe Michio was there at that one. I forget. But he wasn't part of that debate. Um, anyways, yeah, uh, Doug Guyvet was another one on that, on the Believer team. But yeah, okay, so, but I take your question to be, what about William Lane Craig's arguments? Yeah. Okay, they're pretty good arguments. He's a smart, rational guy. But again, I, you know, there are perfectly good counter arguments going all the way back to David Hume. 
I mean, David Hume in his great work, uh, but he dealt with all those arguments. You know, here are the top arguments for the existence of God. Here's why they don't hold. And, you know, those arguments have been debunked ever since. So the ones that William Lane Craig makes have been debunked, or at least they've been countered. Mm -hmm. And again, if you already believe in God and you're that firm in your conviction, this is my faith, and, oh, and here's some good arguments by William Lane Craig that makes me feel even better about my beliefs, well, good for you. But I read the arguments and they don't convince me. And, and not only that, but they don't convince most professional philosophers, the vast majority of professional philosophers who are best trained to understand those arguments and evaluate them, nevertheless, uh, are not theists. They're atheists or agnostics, or they're deists or they're whatever, but they're not, they're not religious. In the same way that Jews do not accept the arguments for the, uh, the resurrection of, of Jesus. They don't think the carpenter from Nazareth was the Messiah. They believe in the Messiah. They think the Messiah is coming. They believe in the same God as Christians, Yahweh. They believe in the same book, at least the Old Testament. They just don't think the prophecies in the Old Testament about who the Messiah is going to be, what the Messiah is going to be like, was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. They just don't see it. And you can go through all the arguments, the empty tomb and the uh, post death of apparitions and appearances of Jesus to the disciples and Mary and on and on. You can go through all that. And Jewish rabbis who are fully equipped to understand these arguments, they're professionally trained philosophers, essentially. You know, they just go, no, nah, I'm not buying it. it. Those aren't, those arguments are not that good. The evidence is not that good. Now, Christians will go, yes, the arguments are good. Well, if they're so good, how come most people don't believe them? I mean, Muslims don't believe them. Jews yeah. don't believe them. Hindus, Buddhists don't believe it. You know, the, because the evidence and the arguments are not that good. They're okay. Again, if you already believe, they're okay. Yeah. So I watched Bart Ehrman uh, against uh, yeah. against William McCann, and Bart Ehrman doesn't believe in empty tombs. The evidence of empty empty tomb is not as good as the existence of Jesus. Because <laughs> yes, right. yeah, so. Right. But even, yeah, the, you know, the tomb is empty. So what? What does that mean? That's what Bart says. And, and then he concocts some interesting stories about what could have happened. He's not, I'm not saying this is what happened. I'm just saying a lot of things could have happened. Yeah. Bart's yeah. very good. The reason I like Bart is because he, first of all, he used to believe. Second of all, he went to Bible school. I mean, he went to the one of the hardcore fundamentalist Bible schools before he went to a professional theological uh, school to get his degree. And so he knows the arguments inside and out. He knows, he knows exactly what Christian theists uh, and apologists argue, and he shows why those arguments are not that good. Yeah. He went to Moody Bible School, where Bible is his, is his middle name. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I would put a plug in not only for Bart Ehrman's books, but also his teaching company courses. You can take his courses online, uh, which he has lectures, like a, dozens of lectures. They're really quite good. Yeah, but some atheists, uh, some atheists didn't agree with, don't agree with Bart Eman because Bart Eman made a book called Did Jesus Exist, where he... Yeah, those are the mythicists. They don't think someone named Jesus even existed. Yeah. I don't think their arguments are that good. I'm familiar with them. I've read those books and read the arguments. They're okay. Uh, but I, I, I follow Bert, Bart on this one. I think his arguments that Jesus probably really did exist uh, is pretty good. You know, so yeah. I mean, first of all, Jesus, Jeshua, not an unusual name. Lots of different spiritual leaders in the first century. Um, you know, that the claims that he was making were not that unusual. I mean, Bart has a whole lecture on how Jesus became God. Yeah. And in fact, there were lots of people that were, you know, gods used to routinely come down from the heavens and have sex with humans. This was quite common. <laughs> I mean, mythically speaking, <laughs> not literally. <laughs> And, uh, you know, lots of, you know, pe people at that time believed this sort of thing could happen and that miracles, signs and wonders were everywhere. But everything was a sign and wonder, you know, of the storms and lightning and, you know, disasters. These are all signs of, you know, the gods must be angry you know, or, or whatever. Um, so most of the claims, you know, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the performance of miracles, the raising of the dead— these were quite common in the first century. Um, you know, people believed all sorts of things like that. Mm -hmm. 
So do you think that religion is good for a human? Well, yeah, okay, that's a tough one because if somebody is suffering a loss of somebody yeah. they loved and they say, you know, believing that there's an afterlife and I will see my loved one again, yeah. I would be disinclined to say that's a bunch of baloney and it's not true. I, I probably I would not say that. Uh, you know, I would I would just acknowledge their belief, you know, and I understand why believing that makes you feel better. I, I get that. I do. But but again, and, and think of it as a separate category of beliefs. It it's not literally true, empirically true, and most people don't mean it that way. They really mean it like this makes me feel better. Okay. You know. Uh, I understand that. So I, I don't want to take that away from somebody. On the other hand, I don't want to live in a world in which everybody believes that there's a ghost in the machine, a soul that floats off the brain and goes into the quantum ether or wherever it's yeah. supposed to go, <laughs> uh, wherever heaven's supposed to be located. Uh, you know, uh, in general, if you're going to ask me intellectually about those kinds of claims, then I'm going to give you an honest answer. Mm -hmm. If it's clear that the person's not trying to engage with me in some kind of search for truth about the world, and they're just saying, this is what I believe. Okay. Then I'm probably not going to respond. Yeah. So the claim that religion is good and religion is true is two separate things, right? Like, like, like uh, Aya and Hesia Ali, who become Christian. Uh, oh, I see. In the larger sense of good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's my take on that. You know, religion is a very big topic. <laughs> you mm -hmm. can't say it's good or bad. You know, it, religion is good when it does good. It's bad when it does bad. You know, when it leads to people flying planes into buildings, that's bad. Mm -hmm. Right? When it leads to people manning the soup kitchens and helping the poor, okay, then that's good. I mean, we should help people that are in need. We should, uh, privately and maybe even publicly through taxes. You know, we we should have some kind of safety net for people, in, you know, through the government to help them. Um, I prefer more private charity, but you can have both. And so to the extent that, say, Christians give more money than non-Christians to charities in America, that's true. Okay, fine. Good. I'm glad. And we should all do more of that anyway. Okay, so I will acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. On the other claims, like religious people live longer or they're happier, it could be. Uh, there's some evidence for that, and but but it's, it has nothing to do with like God rewarding you with an extra year of your of life or extra <laughs> you can live an extra two point six years longer than the atheist. What it has to do with is lifestyle choices, yeah. and that people are religious tend to be a little more risk averse in their lifestyle. They drink less. They have less risky sex. They smoke less. They're more likely to go to the doctor for checkups. You know, same thing with married people. Married people, whether you're religious or not, you know, they, they tend to be happier, healthier, live longer lives. Yeah. You know, so it's it has to do with the social structure and lifestyle that has to do with, you know, how long you live or whatever. And having purpose and meaning in your life of any kind lead, makes people happier and feel yeah. like they have a more purposeful life. So to the extent that religion makes some people feel that way, okay, then yeah, let's acknowledge that. But you don't need religion for that. There's lots of ways to get it. So that would be my next question. So as an atheist, how do you deal with uncertainty? I mean, life is full of uh, uncertainty, right? Life after death, maybe there is, maybe there's not. So how do you deal with that? I deal with it by just enjoying it. I like uncertainty. I don't I don't want the world to be highly predictable. I like that it's not predictable because it means I get to have some say in it. I get to have a part, a role. I get to anticipate what might happen and then be pleasantly surprised when it doesn't or does in some other way. Um, all that's great. I mean, that's the nature of reality. It's very, very contingent and chance-driven. The future is beyond a few years it's pretty much unpredictable. Nobody knows what's going to happen. I don't know, let's say in Ukraine in the next two years, nobody knows, um, you know, how the, when will the Middle East finally settle into a two state solution? Who knows? Nobody knows, right? What's the stock market going to do tomorrow? I don't know. <laughs> uh, nobody knows. Don't give your money to some stockbroker who tells you he can predict what's going to happen tomorrow. He can't, nobody can. And that's true across the board. You know, nobody knows the future. But on uh, on the other hand, that's exciting. It means 
maybe you get to change the future in some way for yourself personally. Maybe you can make the world a little bit better place for everybody. Are you afraid of death? Uh, am I afraid of death? Not well. I'm no because I won't experience it. You, by definition, you have to be alive to experience something. <laughs> I, I guess I'd, I'd say uh, I, I, I'm afraid of the dying process, being miserable. I don't want to put my family and myself through. You know, I don't know months or years of cancer. Say, you know, fortunately, I'm 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 still super healthy. But you know, if it happened, I, I would not enjoy that. So I don't look forward to that. But in terms of like, well, what what about after you're dead? Well, you might as well ask me where were you uh, before you were born. Mm. Would I would just say, what are you talking about? I wasn't anywhere. Yeah. I wasn't born. I didn't exist. And that's where I'll be after death. I just simply will cease to exist. Now, I'm happy to be pleasantly surprised. You know, if I wake up and there's you <laughs> in mm -hmm. this other world, or my friends Carl Sagan and Stephen Jay Gould and Isaac Asimov and the amazing Randy, you know, and all these. The, People I knew and, and enjoy their friendship, and they're all atheists, and they're in this other Ethereum place. Okay, I'll, I'll go. You know, I'll, I'll enjoy it, uh, but we'll see. You know, or we won't. Probably we won't. <laughs> uh, I think I'm. I I still afraid of that. Maybe it 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 was because of my upbringing. I mean, I have I have this dream somewhere in my life that I. I die, and when I die, I I lost my my sight, I lost my hearing, but I still conscious. So there is just nothingness. I conscious, but I can do anything. I can even I can even uh, move my hand or move my feet. All I see is blackness, nothingness. I can hear nothing, but. I am conscious for maybe 10 minutes and that is really scary. I mean, what if Yes, that? yes. <laughs> Have you ever gone through uh, under general anesthesia for surgery? Oh no, never. Okay, I have several times. I've had two hip replacements and a neck fusion and other stuff and um it, and there's nothing to experience. You just fall asleep, but with, there's no dreams. It's just like sleep, but no dreams. There's yeah. no sentient. There's no memories formed. It's just lights out. And then, fortunately, they come back on because somebody's controlling that with general anesthesia. Uh, but uh, as near as I could tell, death is going to be like that. It's just three, two, one, lights out. You don't experience anything. So the dream you're having is is you're still sentient. You're perceiving things. But if, if it was a true blackout, you wouldn't perceive anything. Yeah. Now, you know, there are some conditions of general anesthesia, very, very rare, but not unheard of, uh, where the patient kind of wakes up inside the anesthesia uh, and is aware of what's going on, but can't say anything, can't move, can't scream out. And they feel the surgeon's, surgeon's knife and they're like, this is awful. Uh, and they, you know, they can't explain that until later after they are brought out of general anesthesia and they go, Hey, I, I was actually awake. You know, I forget that there's a term for this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, all anesthesiologists know about this. Um, and it's a concern. You don't want the person to wake up in the middle of surgery and go, Hey, screaming silently. Uh, you know, so it's possible, you know, you could have something like that. Probably not. Most people that experience near death experiences, NDEs, Uh, they're mostly positive, not all. There's maybe less than 10% or negative, but most of them are positive. They have a kind of a warm glow, a feeling of love and being embraced, seeing loved ones that you know they were connected to, not arch enemies or whatever. Yeah. Uh, most of them go to something like a heavenly place, not a hell, um, and so on. So even if your dream ends up being something like what you described, it's not likely to be negative. It's probably going to be positive. Who knows? I I I hope that is the case. When when I die, I go back to to nothingness. Uh, but that's what most people believe before the modern world. I mean, Jews, yes. ancient Jews, their uh, the idea of the afterlife is nothing. There's no afterlife. Yes. You just it's just lights out. That's it. Nothing. Yes. Nothing happens.
Yeah, I read that on But I Must Book Heaven and Hell. So the idea yes. of Heaven and Hell just yeah. Okay, I think that is all up. Yeah. So again, really thank you, Michael Sema. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Good luck over there in yes. Indonesia. If I get over there, uh, uh, then uh, we'll see what we can do to help. Yeah, I, I'm really sure that people in Indonesia need more people like you or dog kids. Or I really mm. wish that car second is here again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Me too. <laughs>